We are finishing up our sermon series on what it means to have kingdom impact in our lives and relationships. And I want to share with you from God's word a concept that says we are better together. And focus our attention this morning on the blessing and the power of spiritual relationships. Now, last week I shared with you, uh, we are designed to be part of a life-giving community that connects people together in relationships, but ultimately that connects that community to live out disciple-making, disciples who make disciples, who make disciples. And we, and we spent a lot of time last week looking at the powerful friendships of a, of a paralyzed guy and his four friends. That this community of these five guys and their friendships were so deep that these four were willing to do whatever it took to get their friend to meet Jesus. These four friends had the faith to believe that Jesus could literally change their friend's life forever. So they took a bold step of faith, regardless of the obstacles, ignoring all socially acceptable rules of engagement, destroyed property, interrupted the rabbi teaching so they could bring their friend to Jesus. And in that defining moment for that paralyzed guy, Jesus not only took care of his pressing need to be healed, but his greatest need to be forgiven. And so here's a reality. I need friends like that in my life who are going to do whatever it takes to bring me to Jesus. Friends who have the faith to believe that Jesus can heal whatever I'm struggling with. Friends who are going to do whatever it takes to make sure I stay in relationship with Jesus. And not only do those kind of friends in my life, so do you. And not only do I need those kind of friends in my life, but I need to be one of those friends in somebody else's life. And so do you. Remember, we're in a sermon series that's focused on how we can make kingdom impact in the spaces where we live, where we work, where we play, where we gather, where we learn, and what it means to live as a baptized child of God who lives fully alive in God's grace. You know, we talk a lot about, well, I do a lot, talk about what it means to live fully alive in God's grace. I want to make sure you hear this. This is from John 10.10, where Jesus said, the thief comes to kill, steal, rob, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life abundantly. And so we're talking about not just living fully alive. Man, you you can live fully alive all kinds of ways. I'm talking about can you live fully alive when life stinks? Can you live fully alive when things are going against you? When things aren't going your way, when tragedy strikes, how do you live fully alive? I believe by God's grace. Living fully alive in God's grace is very different than just living fully alive. And so last week as we looked at the importance of those life-giving friendships, I want to expand that concept and go deeper and talk about developing intentional spiritual relationships that are aimed at spiritual reproduction and spiritual maturity. And so I'm gonna invite you to turn your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter four. It's a challenge, it's a hard book to find, it's in the Old Testament, Little, little, little secret. If you don't know where it is, there's this incredible invention called the Table of Contents. Open there the count of contents, find the book page number, you'll go there. You'll get there quicker than the person who's acting like they know where it is. I promise you. But we're going to be on page 555 if you're using the Bibles in front of you. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Now, I want you all to know a little bit of backstory about the book of Ecclesiastes. It's a depressing book. I mean, it explores life without God. It, it, it explores exposes the ultimate bankruptcy of trying to find meaning and purpose and happiness and security and satisfaction in stuff, 
and status, things apart from God. Nothing wrong with those things, but if our entire wealth and worth is based on those things, we're going to find out, as the writer to Ecclesiastes said, man, I looked around and I had everything. I had vineyards. I, had, I made the front cover architectural digest. I mean, they were looking at my stuff, and I had the best, and I looked out, surveyed everything, and guess what? It was meaningless. Vanity. And so here you have a guy who, who, is, who is trying to live fully alive without God. You see, the book of class, Ecclesiastes can be a bit depressing at times, but it's an incredible reminder of what it means to live far beyond the immediate and find true freedom in God's grace and spirit. Now, we're going to be in verse 9 of Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12 is oftentimes read at weddings. and It's a great text for a marriage. I've, I've, I've preached on it. So, it's, so when I go through this, you weren't wrong by using Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12 for your wedding. I love it as a wedding text. Okay? It's a great text for husband and wife that they're entering a Christian marriage uh, with Christ in the center. There's a cord of three strands. The husband, the wife, Christ. That in that threesome, that marriage can withstand pressures of life, navigate the daily mundane, the challenges all together. But today, I want to expand our vision a little bit further than just related to a marriage. And I've never taken a look at Ecclesiastes chapter 4 in terms of discipleship. I always looked at it as a wedding text. How does this text apply? How do we expand the lives of God's people, whether you're married, whether you're single, whether you're widowed, divorced, separated, engaged, male, female, young, old, going to school, not going to school, working, retired, whatever? Because there's some profound truths in these four verses of Scripture about companionship, about unity, about support. But they're all centered around a call to discipleship in Christ. It speaks volumes about the strength found in togetherness and intentional spiritual relationships as a metaphor for the journey of life that we are on together. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples. And it says, as you are going in the spaces where you live, work, learn, play, gather, you are to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. But I want to make sure you guys hear something loud and clear. Everything that we're talking about this morning flows from living as his forgiven redeemed children. We're talking about what it means to live out our baptismal identity in Christ. God placed his name on our hearts and our lives as his children. He calls us his own. He connects us to his death and his resurrection. And we're his children, marked by him, belonging to him. And so as his forgiven children, how do we live fully alive in God's grace? How do we live out our baptismal identity in the everyday, the mundane, the struggles? Look at verse 9, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, page 555 in the Bible's in front of you. The writer says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for the toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Now, the writer of the Ecclesiastes highlighting the inherent strengths and productivity found in a partnership. Now, in the context of, a, of discipleship and discipling relationships, this speaks the importance of Christian fellowship, Christian accountability, and spiritual relationships. Two are better than one. Now, Imagine this in the context of Palestine before Christ. A traveler on his or her own at night, especially, and they fall, it might prove fatal. A leg might be broken. Ribs might be cracked. Trauma to the head. The single traveler has no one there to give medical attention. The traveler with a companion has someone to pull him up. Pull them out, 
of a ditch or a pit, someone to, to put a splint on the broken bones, someone to bandage the wound, someone to put a tourniquet on, whatever it might be, to bring that traveler to safety. Y'all, we are not meant to take this journey of life alone. We're to be together. We're not to travel alone. Not only should we have friendships, but these friendships to develop in life-giving community. I don't have that. Or maybe you're saying, I want that, or maybe I don't want that. I'm just telling you all, we are not meant to be alone. And I'm going to ask you to start praying if you haven't already been, and keep praying how God can bring this person into your life. Because I believe there's an even deeper dimension that we might miss out if we aren't intentional in developing spiritual relationships. Look at verse 11. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Okay, great wedding text. Okay, I got it. All right. And it might sound strange to us outside of a reference to a wedding. But it's also referencing that traveler on a cold night in Palestine. The reader or the writer to Ecclesiastes is, is writing to us about the importance of intentional community. Hotels, VRBOs, not as common back then. Maybe a major city might have a place for lodging. But when people traveled on foot, it was not always possible to get to the next town and the safety and warmth of lodging. And so in those kind of situations, it was very common for a, ca- a traveler to sleep under the stars or in a cave. Palestine, Palestine nights, even during the summer months, can be very cool. And so the travelers would find it necessary to sleep in groups, typically one for men, one for women, another group for children. This way they stayed warm and comfortable. Y'all, that's the benefit of Christian community. Verse 12, and though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. This is a great reminder about defense for the traveler from the criminal or awaiting roadside bandit. As Christians, in intentional spiritual relationships, We are there to strengthen, sustain, but also speak truth into one another. To support, to encourage, but to also point out blind spots that we might not be aware of. You see, sometimes I need a battle buddy to defend me against myself. I mean, think of the world we're in right now. How, don't raise your hand. How angry are you right now with things you're seeing in the world, in our politics, in our nation, and all these different things? And me just mentioning right now is getting you fired up. Can I just tell you right now, the devil is having a heyday with all of us right now. We get so wrapped around the axle about all the things going on in our lives that we have literally no control over, but yet, here's what we can do. We can yell at the TV, and then we can hop on Facebook and post it, because it's going to change everybody's opinion. And then all the whole thing I've done is all I've done is made myself mad. And Ephesians 4.25 or 26 reminds us, in your anger, don't sin, don't give the devil a foothold. Do you realize what we're doing right now is we're allowing the devil into our anger. We're allowing the devil to swirl around and speak into us, and all it's doing is ticking us off and ready to go get somebody. And the devil's going, ching. The lack of unity that we have right now. The struggles we face as people. I need someone in my life to tell me, dude, you gotta chill. I'll just tell y'all a little insight. I'm a political junkie. I love watching politics. 
But I'm not going to tell you how to vote. I'm not going to tell you all the political things that, about what you need to do. No, it's not, not my role. But I do know that if I don't have someone speaking truth into me, that someone doesn't say, hey, you got to back off a little bit right now because you're losing your voice, not only figuratively but literally, and you might lose your pastor card. I need someone as a battle buddy as I travel on the journey of life to defend me against others, but also defend me against myself. And the writer adds a spiritual dimension that takes place in this life-giving community that I believe shifts it from friendships to spiritual relationships. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. You see, the rope makers back then would understand a single cord, a double cord, but a three-strand cord is going to be stronger. Spiritual relationships, intentional spiritual relationships between me, you, and Jesus. And it's aimed primarily at spiritual maturity and spiritual duplication or replication. It's about helping more people live life with Jesus every day, with Christ at the center of it all. You know, during this series, we've been highlighting different individuals who have engaged in a six-month intentional disciple-making journey with other people. These individuals are, are, are part of a group called Followers Made, in which they meet together weekly, they learn and practice spiritual disciplines that turn into daily habits and build life-giving community that we pray will morph into spiritual, intentional spiritual relationships to live as a disciple of Jesus. Tina Hergenrader was one of our members, and she participated in one of our followers made huddles. She's a wife, she's a mom of four. She's authored 12 books. She's a gifted speaker to women and teens. Listen to what she had to say about developing spiritual relationships through followers made. Let's watch this. We always do hear about one-on-one -on -one being the best kind of intentional discipleship. And then all of a sudden, with this new model, we found that we, it kind of multiplied, like was exponential benefits because there were other connections besides someone pouring into you and, and you investing in someone else. There's also another layer of a community that starts to form and that had definitely grown from the, the intense time we had been together. And so I think that those women became that. And then I also see that that also is mirrored in our own lives and in, in family circles and colleagues where you start to realize not only do we need connection and not only do we need intentional discipleship, but we really need a community to form because there's strength in that, in that community that, that is more than just two people. And there's something extraordinary about so many people saying, hey, I see this gift in you. I see your characters change over this journey. And that was astounding. And then it really is confirmation that you see, you're like, wow, this is, must be something that is changing that maybe I felt, but now I have these people that have been witness to it. And it's kind of what we all, I think, are deeply longing for. And that is okay to say because we're human and God designed us for intentional connection and has given us systems for that, like our families and our other, our church and our, our Christian community. But in today's society that is busier and is more isolated, it makes sense that we would of course be more intentional. And so once I was in it, I realized, oh, this is, this is clearly was an answer to the question I didn't know I was asking. something we deeply long for. I can tell you the majority of people who signed up for these huddles or were a part of them, they said they didn't have time to do them. It's, it's a big commitment. It's a weekly commitment. It's six months long. But watching the transformation happen because they were a part of these huddles, because they were in part of this intentional discipleship environment, we're seeing disciples becoming disciple makers. 
And by the way, that QR code that's in front of you in the back of the pews, the one in front of you, if you click on that or if you take a picture of that QR code, there's actually a button on there that says fully alive um, interest. And all you have to do is click on that button and it goes right an email to Jason Phelps, our discipling director. And there'll be a follow-up with you and find out more. This is, you're not signing blood covenant here, okay? This is just saying, I want to know more. I want to learn more. I want to know if this is for me. I believe we had like 35 people sign up last week. Man, I was praise Jesus for that. That's just pretty awesome. I want you guys to know when Tina was saying something, there's something we're all deeply longing for, it's work. But it's amazing. You see, our journey of faith is not meant to be a solo journey. And so as followers of Jesus, we gotta intentionally seek out and invest meaningful relationships within the body of the Christ. Who are the people walking alongside of you in your faith journey? Who's lifting you up? Who are you lifting up? I was told early on in ministry, and I truly believe it evermore today, that every person needs three types of people in their life. A Paul, a Timothy, a Barnabas. What do I mean by that? Paul. Paul is the teacher. Paul is the mentor. Paul, who's someone who's walked the path of faith longer than, than the individual and provide wisdom and guidance and faith formation. To not navigate the complexities of life with faith. Paul, Paul exemplified his, his relationship with young Timothy. He provided teaching and correction and encouragement, and he helped Timothy to grow as a strong leader in the early church. You know that mission trip video? I saw the first thing this morning. Van and Caden, I didn't know y'all could have moves like that. I mean, come on now. I'm expected now more often, because I saw you can do it, and I also saw a bunch of high school kids who do a lot of work, so parents are duly noted. But did you see the young kids in that video watching what they were doing? Whether they realized that not those two in the whole group, Sam was in there also. I expect Sam to do that. But they were being Paul's. They were mentoring and teaching younger kids who said, you know what, it's kind of, it's okay to be crazy in worship or have fun or be silly because those older kids are doing it and they're cool. Yeah, they think you're cool, guys. I know it's hard to believe, but they do think you're cool. Timothy, let me back up. Who's your Paul? Who's, who are you being Paul to? Timothy, having a Timothy in our lives, meaning we're going to invest in someone who has brand new in the faith, maybe. To help them, like Ecclesiastes talks about, helping them to avoid pitfalls and, and recover from their mistakes. This is more than Paul just instructing Timothy. It was encouraging him. It was empowering him. It was saying, dude, you got this. Who can be a Timothy in your life? Barnabas. Barnabas' names mean, means encouragement. It represents a type of relationship where mutual support and encouragement are paramount. There's strength found with an encourager, one who walks alongside of us, provides strength, comfort, defense against spiritual attacks. You see, Barnabas played a critical role in Paul's life, especially when others doubted Paul's conversion. He stood by Paul, he vowed for Paul, and he helped Paul integrate into the Christian community. Y'all, we all need a Barnabas in our lives, someone who believes in us, stands by us, encourages us to persevere. I got some pretty cool Barnabas in my life. I gotta tell you, my biggest Barnabas is my wife. If she tells me I got it, I got it. In fact, I know, I know she intentionally gets up on special Sundays when I'm nervous as all get out. Easter's a big one. And she says, you got this. That's all I need to hear. 
My girls do it to me now also. Who's your Barnabas? Who's encouraging you? On this Father's Day dance, I want you to think about this. You're actually a Paul. Think about all the teaching you're doing and mentoring with your kids. Think about as a Timothy, when, when, when that first one was born and you're like, can we just stay here in the hospital? And you said, oh my gosh, should I take them home? How, how do we do this? I know what all of y'all did, but I went and talked to other dads. I said, guys, you gotta teach me because the manual never showed up. And, and, and guys, as a Barnabas, what a blessing to have other guys cheer you on. So if you don't have a Paul in your life, pray about it and look for someone who can be a spiritual mentor and then go ask them. They will be honored. Do you have a Timothy in your life? If you don't, pray about it and look for someone who's eager and ready to grow in their spiritual walk and journey and invite them into a life-giving spiritual journey with you. You're like, no, I can't do that. That's arrogant. No, it's not. It's powerful. Do you have a Barnabas in your life? If you don't, Look for someone who loves to affirm others, who has a gift of encouragement, and just tell them, I need an encourager. Would you be my Barnabas? I'm telling you, that's probably the most beneficial area that I've had on my spiritual journey. Identify your Paul, your Timothy, your Barnabas. Approach them, express a desire to grow deeper and set up regular times to meet and, and commit to be intentional. I'll leave with this. When Jesus called the 12, they were just regular, regular guys, uneducated, rough, tough, ragtag, bunch of guys. He invited them into a discipling relationship. And as they became disciples, they became friends. And they developed these incredible spiritual relationships that literally brought the gospel to the ends of the earth. So y'all, imagine if we can continue to live out our vision that if every man, woman, and child of Gloria Day would know and live their calling as a disciple of Jesus Christ to impact their community so that others will live fully alive in God's grace. May God grant that to each of us for Jesus' sake. To God alone be the glory.